Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, it's a privilege to speak to you all. I'd actually like to start by making a slight change in the title of my presentation. Uh, and I hope that will be uh, acceptable to you. I'm going to talk about th really the same thing that's in the title, but give it a new title that I think is better. I'm going to talk about Protestants, Catholics, and re-evangelizing Western civilization 500 years after the Reformation. Now, I've taken that liberty. Uh, I used the term initially of talking about the great gulf between Protestants and Catholics, and that was, of course, the way Karl Barth talked about our Protestant-Catholic relationship 100 years ago. But I think the task that the Lord has given to some of us is that of re-evangelizing Western civilization. And we have to do that thinking about our relationship with Roman Catholics today, and that will include learning how to love them better. I'll have four parts in my presentation. Part one is I'm going to call it evangelization and European identity. Now, I want to start in what some may take to be a bit of an odd place in asking what makes Europe to be European? Or maybe more sharply, what makes Western civilization to be Western civilization? Uh, of course, since antiquity, Europeans have claimed that Europe is distinct from Asia. But then the question always comes up, well, how is Europe distinct from Asia? And of course, there have been numerous attempts to draw the line between Europe and Asia. No one knows for sure where it is, or at least several people have different ideas about where the line should be between Europe and Asia. And the better commentators on the question always end saying, the difference is finally cultural. The difference between Europe and Asia is a cultural distinction, and no one knows for sure where that line should be. But, and that relates to our topic of re-evangelizing the West, especially if it was the first evangelization of Europe that created Europe. And I would suggest that Europe is European and not West Asia because of the first evangelization of this region of the world. Of course, that began in the first century. The first Christian missionaries arrived in Europe in the time of the New Testament. Much of the evangelization of Europe happened between the years, say, 400 and 1300. That's when those of us who have European roots, that's when our ancestors first came to hear about Christ. And there were many themes in Christian theology and ethics that created, that contributed to the creation of European society. But it was especially certain Christian philosophical conceptions about humanity, rationality, and progress that created Western civilization and caused it to flourish. Now, in making this claim that Christianity led to the creation of Europe, I don't want to ignore the Greco-Roman roots of our European heritage, but I would note that the Greco-Roman roots of Western civilization were communicated in Europe by Christian missionary scholars, first in the monasteries, later in the cathedral schools at a later time in European history, later in the founding of the great European universities, but the Greco-Roman heritage came to Europe via Christian missions. And trust in human dignity, rationality, and progress across Europe was the fruit of evangelization, including the parts of that that came with, from Greco-Roman roots. Now, the worldview-driven development of European society was very, very practical. The era that was once called the Dark Ages by secularists was really an era of tremendous technological growth in the West. Between 500 and 1300, one saw the widespread application of water mills and windmills, the effective use of horses for agriculture and travel, the development of deep plows that revolutionized agriculture, the invention of eyeglasses, compasses, and clocks. And this tremendous technological growth of Europe occurred simultaneously with the Christianization of Europe the first time around. Sociologist Rodney Stark commented, quote, all these remarkable developments can be traced to the unique Christian conviction that progress was a God-given obligation 
entailed in the gift of reason. The new technology, that new technologies and techniques would always be forthcoming was a fundamental article of Christian faith. Hence, no bishops or theologians denounced clocks or sailing ships, although both were condemned on religious grounds in various non-Western societies. Technology developed in the West simultaneously with and fueled by the Christianization of Europe. This development in European culture was also theoretical. There we see a multifaceted link among Christianity, rationality, and recognizing human dignity that developed in European thought, and in fact became one of the distinguishing characteristics that makes European thought different from the patterns of thought in other cultures. And we see this especially in the great Christian philosophers, Augustine from the 4th, 5th century, Anselm in the 11th century, Aquinas in the 13th century, these men were simultaneously God-fearing, deeply godly men who were also the elite philosophers of the era, using models of rationality, tools of analysis that they learned from classical Greek sources. They developed the biblical classical synthesis that took selected themes from Greek and Roman metaphysics, ethics, and pedagogy, but placed it inside a Christian worldview within inside a Christian definition of human nature and destiny. And these principles that they put together undergirded the development of European civilization for a millennium and still has some influence today. Europe is European because of the first evangelization. Let's move to the second evangelization of Europe. Meanwhile, because of widespread illiteracy, corruption, power politics, bad theology, and the accretion of, of traditions, the Christian message became too entwined with submission to the visible church, which in Western Europe meant the Catholic Church. And that church faced little competition, and it veered off course very severely by medieval times. Martin Luther's challenge to the church that began a few hundred meters from here 500 years ago was urgently needed. This led to the second evangelization of Europe, flowing from the Reformation in its various forms. The new Protestants rediscovered grace, justification by faith alone, the liberty of the gospel, and the power of the Bible. Although it would be unfair to, and inaccurate to say the Catholics totally rejected the true Christian faith, they responded defensively to the Reformation institutionally. Think of the Counter-Reformation, the Inquisition. They had strong opposition to what they regarded as the Protestant heresies. Nevertheless, in an important way, Europe became much more European under the influence of the, both the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. With two major competing versions of the Christian faith now in existence, both used rationality and education to defend their version of the truth. Thus, faith-driven rationality became even more clearly a distinctive of European culture, and then American culture descended from it. And this pattern was especially true in the Protestant regions of Europe. The Protestants thought everyone should read the Bible. And this con conviction had massive cultural effects. The Bible was translated into many European languages between roughly 1530 and 1690. And this stabilized the languages. Some of the languages exist today because the Bible was translated into that language. And at the same time, the idea was that everyone should be taught to read. And what was really radical in the conception that everyone should be taught to read the Bible was that girls from poor families should be taught, taught to read so that they could read the Bible. Previously, only boys from wealthy families were taught to read. This had massive effects across Western society. There were other major developments in Europe that also came as a result of the Reformation. Some scholars trace a direct line from the doctrine of justification by faith alone to democracy. 
But we should note that even when they were furthest apart, the Protestants and Catholics agreed massively on religious issues, even though they were in almost constant conflict. They believed in the Trinity, in the Incarnation, the Resurrection, and that the Bible is a unique book from God. Nevertheless, the rivalry between Protestants and Catholics became, in my opinion, too intense. Perhaps because of a lack of other competitors for the hearts and souls of Europeans. During the 16th and early 17th centuries, neither Islam nor secularism was competing for the hearts and minds of Europeans. And even if they were not personally walking by faith, most Europeans were culturally Christians. The question was simply whether one was Catholic or Protestant. But in this context, nevertheless, there was an extremely high level of rivalry between Catholics and Protestants from the early 16th century to the late 19th century. For most of 400 years, there was an intense rivalry. And in this context, the wars in Europe, the great wars from the 16th and 17th century, were often regarded as primarily religious wars, that the primary roots of those wars were religion. We'll come back to that theme in a minute. Now, I see secularism as, in Europe as starting about the year 1650. And it was in the context of overheated antagonism between Catholics and Protestants. Many of the people who promoted early secularism regarded the wars of Europe as primarily religious in nature. And the secularism that developed in the mid 17th century, the mid 1600s, was largely driven by the perception that Protestants and Catholics were so mad at each other for theological reasons that they would go to war again and had gone to war against each other numerous times before. Now, I think that perception of the wars from the 16th and 17th century is partly wrong. As I have read about those wars and looked at who fought and which side in those wars, it looks to me that they were not really always very religious in motivation. Those wars were driven by the normal reasons, greed, the lust for power. But the perception was that these wars were mostly religious in motivation, and that was one of the drivers of secularization. And this is still too true today. Uh, early in the 21st century, I was teaching humanities at a major European university for several years. My students, very, very bright European students from several countries in Europe, regularly said that if Protestants and Catholics today in Europe were not restrained by totally secular governments, they would restart the 16th and 17th century wars of religion. I heard that 12, 14, 15 years ago, teaching at Charles University in Prague. That's what the students all thought, that Protestants and Catholics are ready to go to war again in the 21st century, and we need to keep complete secularism in place in Europe so that Christians don't go to war with each other. Now, I know talking to Protestants and Catholics, that's utter nonsense. None of us want that. But that's how the secular world still perceives us today. That's part of our legacy. And that's one of the drivers of secularism in Europe today. It's terrible. Now, when we look at the Enlightenment origins of modern secularism, not all its leading thinkers were atheists. Some were practicing Christians, such as in some of the great Enlightenment thinkers, regularly quoted the Bible. John Locke did that all the time. His, his texts are full of quotations from the Bible. But generally, the religion of the early Enlightenment, when secularism was getting started, was deism. The idea that God was the great watchmaker who set the world in motion, but then was no longer involved in the world. Now, deism had the big advantage that it allowed Europeans and then many of the early Americans were deists. It had the big advantage that it allowed them to continue to believe in the principles that created Europe, in human dignity, the importance of rationality, and progress. The deists could believe in those three principles without getting into any of the specific things that either Catholics or Protestants believed. 
The deists had no interest in salvation, church, sacraments, the things about, Catholics, about which Catholics and Protestants had disagreed. Deism allowed them to maintain a vague religiosity that supported the principles that had come into Western civilization from Christianity, belief in human reason, human dignity, and progress. But Enlightenment deism was not stable. It tended to deteriorate. Though Enlightenment deism, the beginnings of secularism, was rooted in arguments for the existence of God, it quickly changed because the understanding of rationality changed. And this led to the great atheists of the post-Enlightenment era. I'm thinking of people like Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. They were not only atheists, they were extremely hostile to Christianity, arguing every way they could think of against Christianity. And here we see something all comes with Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. They no longer had a basis to explain human dignity. And their understanding of rationality changed substantially so that they no longer saw rationality as the key to what makes people human. And so that's why, since their time, many of us have the feeling that the principles that shaped Western civilization are at risk. They may even be shaking. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. Many people who are not even Christians today feel like the, the principles that led to the formation of Western civilization are now at risk. Trust in rationality and in human dignity and in progress arose in Europe as organic parts of the Christian worldview. And now the question is, without the specifically theological parts of that worldview, is it possible for people to continue to trust rationality and human dignity? Can the cultural fruit continue without the theological tree on which it grew? Now this situation that we face in Europe and in North America partly has massive effects both on evangelization and on everything we do in the public square today. I will give one example from each. First, in the public square. Without the biblical creation account, people have terrible difficulties explaining where human rights come from. And therefore, they end up with all sorts of competing theories about what kinds of rights people have. The communists say the people have whatever rights the state gives you. Some of the postmodernists say you have whatever rights you give to yourself. Really, they think rights come from the self. Therefore, we have competing claims about what rights people have. But think of evangelization. I know a European woman who became a Christian as an adult after being educated in a communist school. At first, it seemed impossible for her to fathom why Jesus would be significant since she was, in her own mind, a, an arbitrary chance result of who knows what in evolution. And she knew, like everyone else knew, that religion is the opiate of the people. Why could the death and resurrection of Jesus have any significance for her? It was first necessary for her to have some inkling that she was special, that she was created in the image of God. And if she was created in the image of God, then maybe she could, Jesus might be significant in some way because she was significant. She had to first believe in her own creation in the image of God, then she could believe in Jesus and be baptized. So we're in a situation that the lack, the uncertainty about belief in human dignity, rationality, and promise, all of what, progress, all of which are fruits of Christianity, can that continue in the West without the Christian roots? So what about our relationships with Roman Catholics in this situation? We're in a situation where Western civilization is largely the result of Christianity, and we share that with our Catholic neighbors in many ways. We're in a situation where our main competitors today are secularism and Islam. So we need to look again at our relationship with Roman Catholics. 
Now, as historic Protestants, that does not mean we ignore our theological differences. I really am reformed theologically. I affirm the Westminster Confession in good faith. Uh, and so I cannot acknowledge someone as a Christian unless they believe in Jesus as their savior. But we do now need to look harder at our relationship with Roman Catholics and ask, in what ways should we be looking for collaboration? What ways should we be looking for companionship with them? Uh, in what ways should we interact with them? After all, they too, like we, believe that human beings are created in the image of God. Most of them believe that marriage, heterosexual marriage, is a God-given institution. Uh, most of our Catholic neighbors believe that Jesus is central to life. Uh, and most of them share with us a great determination to overcome the horrible, horrendous persecution of Christians in our time. So let's think for a moment about the Catholic Church. Now, sociologically, the Catholic Church is immensely different from Protestants. Uh, we have splintered into a thousand denominations. They have kept together under one gigantic tent. But that doesn't mean there's not the same diversity among Catholics that there is among Protestants, even evangelicals. It's just that they try to appear to be under one tent. But there's massive diversity within Catholicism today. We have a conservative Catholic wing, a liberal wing, and an evangelical wing. We have charismatic Catholics who are virtually indistinguishable from Pentecostals, except that they may go to Mass and say an occasional Ave Maria. You have some Catholics whom I've met who sound a lot like me, quoting Martin Luther on the relationship between God's moral law and the Gospel. On the other hand, we have prom prominent Roman Catholics who deny the virgin birth. You have other Roman Catholics who are worshiping statues. Uh, because of the history of Protestant Catholic conflict, I think we must avoid the strong condemning language that some of our ancestors used about Roman Catholics. I think we should not call the Pope the Antichrist, though one or two might have qualified. We should not call the Catholic Church the whore of Babylon, because I don't think there's a biblical basis for that. I think that terminology arose out of conflict without a sufficient biblical basis for making that claim. And as Reformed Christians, we know we should not make strong theological claims without a biblical basis for it. However, it is good to notice that some Roman Catholics use extraordinarily strong condemning theological language to talk about each other. I was quite surprised the first time a prominent Roman Catholic leader told me privately that he thinks most of the Catholic Church is apostate. He sees the Catholic Church as primarily filled with Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, but at the same time, he's afraid for my salvation because he's not sure if anyone who's not a member of the Catholic Church can be saved. That's the kind of conflict you see in the man, mind of one person. And he's a dedicated, very conservative Roman Catholic. Hmm. Some, as I've talked with Roman Catholics, some sound as if they believe in work salvation. Others sound as if they think any honest member of any religion will automatically be saved. Uh, there are Catholics who would like to return to use in Latin most of the time. On the other hand, there are Catholics who are disappointed that their church is not endorsing gay and lesbian marriage yet. There are Catholics who love evangelicals and Protestants, but there are also some who are dreadfully afraid of us. They're scared of us, some of them are. 35 years ago, I heard a good evangelical theologian describe the Roman Catholic Church as a nine-ring circus in which most of the participants in the circus do not know what's going on in the other eight rings of the circus. And if they do know what's going on in the other eight rings of the circus, they probably do not like it. When I studied Catholic theology some 35 years ago under a liberal priest in a secular university, my takeaway message at the end is that he loved the fact that you had competing contradictory theologies 
in the Catholic Church. And he offered them as if they were different meals at a buffet of equivalent value. Complete the opposite theological views within the Catholic Church, and they, he loved that. But in this confusing situation of all kinds of different Catholics who disagree radically with each other on everything you can imagine, yet there probably are some hundreds of millions of Christians there who look to Jesus for the salvation and love the Bible. Some, it even sounds like Pope Francis, preach justification by faith. It looks to me like we have hundreds of millions of Christian brothers and sisters there, even though they're in a very confused church situation and in a church with which we have historic conflicts. Let me add that this immense diversity within the Catholic Church is mediated to Protestants by very different local situations, meaning different church-state relationships and different demographics. There are regions in several countries yet today where the local social situation is dominated by the Catholic Church to the extent that evangelicals and Protestants feel marginalized, they may experience discrimination. On the other hand, during the communist era, we heard lots of reports of evangelical pastors and Catholic priests becoming prayer partners while in prison. And in some places in the post-communist world, that still is a major factor in Protestant Catholic relationships because the old men in, the ch in both churches were prayer partners in prison 40 years ago when they were young men. In other countries, it's become simply normal that Protestants and Catholics work in each other's organizations, in the social institutions, political parties, in uh, schools, colleges, universities. In some countries, there are Catholics and Protestants working in each other's organizations seemingly without very much conflict. So the, the situation that we face in trying to figure out how to relate to Roman Catholics is complicated and will always be different from one place to the next. It's very difficult to say exactly how this can work globally. There's one additional question I should mention. And that's the Catholic Church's understanding of authority as it has evolved over time gives them a problem that we do not have. The Catholic Church cannot repudiate publicly something it has said before, though we Protestants do that all the time. They cannot undo what some of their ancestors wrote in the Council of Trent or other statements, even if they would like to do so. So to understand Roman Catholics today with integrity, you have to listen to what that particular Roman Catholic is telling you. You must not assume that he or she accepts or even knows about what their church said in previous centuries. Uh, many Catholics have never considered what's in their historical documents. You might have met an evangelical somewhere who's not fully studied the Westminster Larger Catechism. They have that problem a hundred times more. Their people don't know what's in their own documents, yet they love Jesus and read their Bible. Now, as Protestants, we naturally want principles for how to cooperate with Roman Catholics. Uh, my principle is that if I hear a Roman Catholic clearly confessing Christ, I assume I can probably work with that person to evangelize a third person who might be in the conversation. If I do not hear the Roman Catholic confessing Christ, I assume I need to evangelize that person. And I would say that knowing that many of the renewal movements today in Catholicism happened because some evangelical or Protestant evangelized some Roman Catholics and those Catholics decided to stay in the Catholic Church as new Christians. If we take scripture seriously, a principle that I think has to be prominent is what we read in 1 John 4 verse 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. The key question I have in my mind when I listen to Roman Catholics in private is do they confess 
the incarnation of Christ as the Son of God in a real and serious way? And do they trust in that Christ for their salvation? If we ap apply that principle to our relationships with Catholics today, I think we come to a conclusion something like this, that we can and should cooperate with Roman Catholics in re-evangelizing Western civilization when we're talking about pre presenting the Bible to our world, when we're talking about the Christian worldview and Christian ethics, but it will be impossible to cooperate with Roman Catholics when we're in a situation that involves the sacraments. Therefore, we cannot do church planting with a, between a Protestant pastor and a Catholic priest, can't do that because that involves the sacraments. But most things that do not involve the sacraments, we can cooperate with Roman Catholics. This path of seeking to understand individual Roman Catholics, affirming their faith when we find it, uh, and looking for ways to cooperate wherever we can, is, I believe, following principles that were developed uh, in the previous century when John R. W. Stott led a group of evangelicals in a long series of meetings with Roman Catholics. This was called the Evangelical Roman Catholic Dialogue on Mission, John Stott published a book on that title. I think it was 1986. I would encourage you to find that book so you can read that text. Uh, with the World Evangelical Alliance, we are trying to consistently follow the principles that Stott articulated at that time. Uh, the headings from his book are these. I'll read them to you. The areas where we should cooperate with Roman Catholics as far as possible. Bible translation and publishing use of media, community service, social thought and action, public dialogue, worship, and evangelism. Now the participants in that dialogue went on to discuss carefully the problems of joint evangelical Roman Catholic worship. And they said something that was very interesting. They strongly recommended that both Protestants and Catholics join with each other in their homes for Bible study and prayer. And they encouraged Catholics and Protestants to occasionally visit each other's worship services, especially on special occasions. But they knew it was impossible to cooperate with anything that involved the sacraments. So they recommended letting that question wait, because we can't really participate in each other's sacraments if we really think about what we're doing. So I believe that's what we have to do. We do it really what Stott recommended at that time. Now, when we work with Roman Catholics, we have to disabuse ourselves of the notion that if they come to a real faith in Christ, they will quickly leave the Catholic Church. It's not the same for a Catholic who comes to faith as it is for a Muslim who comes to faith in Christ. We would hope a Muslim would eventually join a Christian church. The Catholics like many Muslims, are also in a cultural situation where their family, their tradition, their culture, their neighborhood is wrapped up in a Catholic church. It's sometimes not wise for them to leave that Catholic church, especially if they're finding real fellowship and are growing in the Lord. And that's happening in some of the Catholic renewal movements today. Many new Christians in the Catholic church are finding real fellowship and growth. At the same time, we have to Remember that cooperation with Roman Catholics will be a sensitive issue for many Protestants, especially in Europe. Uh, some of you here probably have ancestors who were persecuted by Catholics. Uh, there may be some here who still face a little bit of discrimination from Catholics. I would guess there are some people here this evening who grew up in the Catholic Church and did not hear the gospel there, and when you came to faith in Christ, you left the Catholic Church and became a Protestant. There's a few people like that in any big gathering of Protestants. We have to remember that. We have to, but at the same time, we must try to be well informed about what's really happening in the Catholic Church. And that will take a little bit of time and effort. Though I cannot present statistical proof, I'm pretty sure there are several return to the Bible movements in the Catholic Church, real renewals of commitment to Christ. At the same time, the liberal wing of the Catholic Church is clearly in radical decline, as is the liberal wing of Protestantism. 
There, that, so there are changes happening there. So part four, my recommendations of what I think we should do now. Two principles. One, we must practice visible love toward Roman Catholics, especially where there is persecution of Christians and especially where there is a history of Protestant Catholic con conflict. In John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Francis Schaeffer was right, I believe, to say that the unbelieving world around us has the right to evaluate our claim to be disciples of Jesus by whether or not we love other people who are called followers of Jesus. And I think that includes Roman Catholics. Uh, we have to show to the world around us that Catholics and Protestants can love each other, even if we disagree on some theology yet. So it's necessary for us to find ways to do that. That means getting to know Roman Catholics uh, and have lunch with them or have coffee with them and develop real friendships, real relationships. Now, some of you know that Thomas Schermacher likes to take his coffee breaks with Pope Francis. And he's done that perhaps 100 times. Uh, we can't all do that. But most of us can probably find a way to get to know a Catholic priest or educator or activist and simply try to get acquainted. I don't expect any of you to become Roman Catholics. I'm not really afraid of that. But we shouldn't expect too strongly that many Roman Catholics are going to become Protestants. It's usually the people who are, not, who are former Catholics who become Protestants, not many active Catholics become Protestants. That shouldn't be our goal anyway. Our goal should be to practice visible love. And if we do that, with time, that becomes visible. People will see and find out slowly. Second thing we need to do. I believe we need to develop very ambitiously and aggressively a joint conservative Protestant and Catholic effort to re-articulate the philosophical foundations of society, not only within Western civilization, but also where this will help persecuted Christians. In 2015, I invested a huge amount of time on behalf of the World Evangelical Alliance in developing the Tirana Consultation on Discrimination, Persecution, and Martyrdom of Christians. The World Evangelical Alliance did this jointly with the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, and the Pentecostal World Fellowship. At the end, we called about 75 Christian leaders from the West, met 75 leaders of, of persecuted Christians to hear what they had to tell us in the free world. We brought at the end, we put together a to-do list. I would like to read one line from a very valuable to-do list. We said, quote, we call on all educational institutions to develop opportunities and tools to teach young people in particular about human rights, religious tolerance, and the healing of memories and hostilities from the past. That task is mostly unfulfilled. I think we need to do it. I would like to ask the World Reform Fellowship to consider how we will do that, what we will do. I think we need a large-scale, joint, Protestant-Catholic effort to re-articulate the principles that led to the formation of Western civilization. That means publishing and writing together. And that should have three goals. The first is a pre-evangelistic goal, to re-establish the credibility of the Christian worldview. The second goal is we need to try to firm up the foundations, the philosophical foundations of Western civilization. Western civilization is shaky right now because the, foundation, the philosophical foundations are weak. We should work together to firm them up. And third, we should do together what we can to intervene in an academic educational way in ways that would help persecuted Christians. There are things that we can write and publish that may shape cultures where 
Christians are terribly persecuted today. And that will have to be done in languages other than European languages. I'm thinking especially of Mandarin, Russian, Arabic, and Vietnamese. There's a huge project that we should in begin on, I think. Now, as a baby step in this direction, uh, my last two books, both on human rights, were jointly published for the World Evangelical Alliance and a Vatican-based think tank. But this is a baby step. It's only uh, not 1% of what should be done. We need to run an ultra-marathon together with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters to re-articulate the things that we hold in common as a basis for our civilization and to help persecuted Christians. Now, we'd have to be cautious in our expectations for cooperation with Catholics. I would be a, a little bit surprised if Pope Francis calls David next week and applies to join the World Reform Fellowship. Might happen, but it would surprise me. But there seem to be millions of Roman Catholics, probably hundreds of millions of Roman Catholics, who are brothers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. In spite of our theological differences, we share much of a common worldview. And we should seek real fellowship and see what we can do together toward the re-evangelization of Western civilization. Thank you.